We as a nation have been long proud to stick out our collective chests and talk about our system of voting and how we lead the way around the world in the democratic process. So what does it say about us when the feeling is about this coming election, we as Americans will by and large detest the person we will be handing the keys to the White House? Perhaps not far from that building where hope should reign supreme, we have a meeting of the minds between Paul Ryan and Donald Trump scheduled for this week. Though depending on which side you speak to, it could be difficult to find two minds in the room at the same time. Then we have the headline that has already been deemed dangerous if read and repeated by anybody on the right. The one in the Wall Street Journal claiming the person Republicans detest more than Satan himself is the true conservative hope for 2016 and beyond. Snap on the tinfoil hat, prep for another round where we question everything and demand you do the same. I'm Ed Berliner. This is The Hard Line for Tuesday, May 10th, 2016. You bring up the next president. We're all anxious yeah. to see who, that. who she is. <laughs> <laughs> I feel confident that Hillary will be the nominee, and I feel confident she'll be the next president. We have truly reached a point where what's happening in American politics could not be more unbelievable if the water supply of the entire nation was filled with hallucinogenic medications. Cases in point. A major publication pointing out what we already know and don't want to say out loud. There's a good chance the person in the White House next year will be the most detested elected official in the history of this nation. And the reason we don't want to talk about it, because we're concerned what it says about us and our choices. The major publication that has come to the conclusion, even some in the Republican Party have already arrived at and won't say out loud for fear of having part of their anatomy stuck on large wooden stakes outside the Cleveland Convention Center, that Hillary Clinton is the best hope for American conservatism. Oh, and one more. A veteran and respected right-leaning columnist who admits he will vote for Donald Trump and then vomit. Please cap your pill bottles and join us because what we say here will be the fodder for your phone calls the rest of this hour at 1-877-NEWSMAX, 1-877-639-7629, and your magic little dialing fingers should already be moving to get in line. First, welcome resident scholar at the American Enterprise Institute, co-author of It's Even Worse Than It Looks, how the American constitutional system collided with the new politics of extremism, Norman Ornstein, joined by veteran conservative and senior policy analyst at the Independent Women's Forum, Hadley Heath Manning. I want to thank you both for joining us. And Norman, seeing as you have a book out that talks about how worse could it get, basically, and it's even going to get any worse, let's talk about this right here at the top. Donald Trump is supposedly running left of Hillary Clinton, and also when we read certain publications, such as Politico, Kyle Kondik and Jeffrey Skelly said together, we appear to be headed for a matchup between perhaps the two most loathed general election candidates in modern U.S. political history. Do you agree with all that? Uh, well, you know, whether Trump is running to the left of Hillary Clinton, I think he's running to the left, to the right, above, below. He's taking policy positions that seem to either change every day or he just makes things up along the way. But he's clearly not running as a consistent conservative, and uh, that's going to confound and frustrate an awful lot of people. Uh, there's also little doubt that we have two nominees, and they're both presumptive nominees, have extremely high unfavorable ratings. Uh, Trump's higher than Clinton's, but it's fairly clear from what we've seen in the last couple of days that he's going to run a campaign that's built around not so much reducing his own unfavorables, but increasing hers, which will probably not uh, make anybody very happy. Hadley Heath, what do you, though, think about that headline in the Wall Street Journal? Hillary, Hillary, the conservative hope. And the subtitle is, the right can survive liberal presidents. Trump will kill its best ideas for a generation. Well, there's certainly a message that's resonating with some conservatives that basically says, regardless of policy, and I agree with Norman when it comes to Trump's ideology, doesn't seem to be a very clearly expressed ideology. It, that hurts him with some voters. It helps him with some other voters. But there is this message that some cons conservatives are grasping onto, which is to say, if Hillary Clinton is in the White House, this is an enemy that we don't have to take responsibility for, that even if we disagree with her on some of the policy positions she puts into place, 
that at least we won't be labeled with the same label. Uh, of course, Donald Trump's going to be running with an R behind his name, as will many conservative candidates within the Republican Party. So this might create some confusion for the voting electorate in terms of what the Republican Party stands for, given that their front runner doesn't really embrace the mantle of conservatism. And yet there are some conservatives who'd rather have Hillary, if only to say, we're not to blame for the mistakes that she might make. As well, let me talk to that confusion, if you will, Hadley Heath. What does it then say to Republicans, the people watching us right now, the hardcore Republicans, when Donald Trump says at a weekend rally, I'm no fan of Bernie Sanders, but he is 100 percent right. Hillary Clinton totally controlled by the people that put up her money. She's totally controlled by Wall Street. But on a series of issues, Mr. Trump, including free trade and foreign military intervention, he is agreeing with Sanders and others and going left to Clinton. What should people on the right, hardcore conservatives, think when the guy that's going to be their nominee says he agrees with the enemy? You know, I think this is a learning opportunity for conservatives that there is a huge chunk of the electorate, not necessarily all on the right hand side of politics, some people on the left as well, who for many years have felt disenfranchised, disillusioned and really voiceless within our political system. And so I think now is a good time for us to be asking ourselves as conservatives and also as, as well-meaning liberals on the other side, what have we done to leave out a huge chunk of people who feel that their voices have not been heard? Which issues have we failed to address? What can we do moving forward to try to find some kind of unity, some way uh, to, to move forward on some of these policy issues where we don't seem to find consensus and certainly not among party lines? Norman, here's the dichotomy of all this, though. Quinnipiac released polling today on a Donald Trump-Hillary Clinton matchup in the key battleground states. According to Quinnipiac, he is leading by four points in Ohio. He is only down by one point in Florida. He is only down by one point in Pennsylvania. Granted, if you look at the numbers in this, this says that women and minorities wouldn't vote for Donald Trump if you put a figurative gun to their head. It is mostly, though, males who are voting for him. But still, the numbers say that he's in there. How do you then match up that with Kurt Schleister, a very well-known conservative columnist who says, I'm going to vote for Trump but it makes me want a projectile vomit. His actual words, they would make me throw up a little that as he types the words, I intend to vote for Donald Trump, that Trump is terrible. How do we put this all together here? First of all, uh, I think it's worth viewers realizing that the Quinnipiac polls are really, really shaky polls. If you look inside those particular polls, they have uh, the electorates in these swing states having a much uh, significantly higher white electorate than we saw in 2012, which is very, very unlikely. They're outlier polls because they're pretty badly constructed. So that doesn't mean Donald Trump can't win, although I think the odds are very slim that he will. But I think Hadley's point is a very good one. Donald Trump, if he were elected, would uh, define the Republican Party in his own terms, and those would not be terms that would be pleasing to uh, consistent conservatives. But at the same time, some of the issues that he's raising the role of big money in politics uh, that's crowding out average voters, free trade that may need at least some rethinking or recasting for people, the whole idea of trickle down when we have uh, stagnant wages and working people struggling, you're going to have to see both parties find ways to address that in a better fashion than they have. And even if it's more significant now because we're in this hyper-populist era in the aftermath of the financial crisis, and at some point that will ebb, uh, those are issues that are not going away. And they're going to be a problem for both parties. But at this point, I think you have to say the Republican Party is in the middle of an existential crisis. Norman, the words you use in there, consistent conservatives. And I want to remind you that the people who are watching the show right now after the break are going to call in. They're going to talk to me about this and they're going to be angry about it because we have consistent conservatives who watch this network 24 seven. Those consistent conservatives, Norman, say you, me, Hadley, everybody is getting it all wrong. We want Trump in there. You're discounting us. You're not taking us into consideration here. So then how do we answer those people who have voted Republican their entire lives who say that Trump is the answer yet? opinionators sit here and say that he's not. Well, uh, that gets back to what I was just saying. Some of those issues that are motivating these voters, and I, I'm not sure how many of them are vo motivated entirely by issues. I think it, as much as anything is Trump's persona, in some ways the strongman persona. 
But there are issues that differ from where the core establishment of the Republican Party has been. And uh, whatever happens, and if Trump loses, there's going to be a strong struggle between Trumpist populists, uh, the kinds of conservatives that Ted Cruz and the Freedom Caucus represent, and the more establishment figures who are a little bit more institutionalist. And how and how and why that comes together, I'm not sure. But there has to be a way of addressing issues in a different fashion. And that includes some of those issues revolving around jobs and the economic concerns of uh, middle class and working class voters. I think you just gave us a new phraseology here. Trump is populist, as a matter of fact. OK, I got two minutes left. I want to focus on VP with both of you for about a minute at a time. Hadley Heath to you first. Norman brought up the name of uh, Ted Cruz. Ted Cruz today said he's not really out of the race. He wants to see what happens in Nebraska, hinting that he might get back in. He said he will not make a third party run. Meantime, we have Rubio, Marco Rubio saying, I don't want the VP. And Donald Trump saying he hasn't ruled out Chris Christie as the VP. First short comment, Ted Cruz, do you really think he'd get back into this? Well, at this point, that would be a very long shot. Of course, he's announced that he's suspended his campaign. People have started to adjust psychologically to the fact that Donald Trump will, in fact, be the front runner. And while there have been many conservatives, grassroots activist types who have backed Ted Cruz up until this point, many of them are starting to consider whether or not they're truly in the so-called never Trump camp, or if many of those people will decide come November that they actually do believe that Trump is a better alternative to Hillary. So there are, there's already the considerations being made, which is the lesser of two evils when it comes to those people who truly identify <laughs> as conservatives. And Ted Cruz did very well with that group. There's that lesser of two evils again. 30 seconds. Last shot to you, Norman. Do you think that Chris Christie would make the kind of vice president that would bring people to the ticket with Donald Trump? Or who do you think might actually take that role? I'm certainly a little skeptical, particularly since Christie's uh, ratings in New Jersey are uh, near the bottom. Uh, we have Ben Carson doing the uh, vetting. Maybe it'll be just like Dick Cheney. Well, but Ben Carson today was announced he's no longer doing the vetting for vice yeah. president at this point. He's taking on some other role. And we had Bob Corker, the chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee, say he wouldn't rule out uh, taking a post like this. I think it's wide open, and if Corey Lewandowski now is the one who's in charge of that vetting, uh, you're more likely to get somebody who's been behind Trump for a long period of time. I agree with that. That's a Jeff Sessions. I, I, I do agree with that. It seems to be picked as somebody who would be more along his liking. We're out of time, unfortunately. Norman Ornstein, Hadley Heath Manning, it's a pleasure to talk to you both. Thanks for joining us. Thanks. All right, we're going to bring in those huddled masses yearning to be heard, the ones that I just talked about a couple of moments ago. Your phone calls are next at 1-877-NEWSMAX, 1-877-639-7629 to hammer away what we have just discussed and prove to America the political brilliance hiding in plain sight across this great country. Don't bring up the Illuminati. The Hardline continues right after this.